Well, thank you. Thank you all very much. Thanks, Susan, for a very kind introduction. Uh, Ron, it is wonderful to be with you in front of what is, as you well know, the greatest intellectual critical mass that assembles in New York at any given time. I'm a little worried that it's so big tonight that it may actually reach critical mass and set off a chain reaction up and down uh, Fifth Avenue or something like that, but uh, really wonderful to be with you. Um, this is an extraordinary book. Uh, I offer congratulations uh, to you on that, on top of all of the others uh, that you have done. Uh, I want to assure you that it is, needless to say, exhaustively researched. Uh, mm -hmm. It is panoramic. It is vast, as you can see. But <laughs> I want to assure you that most of all, it is exceptionally readable, very lively, and truly enjoyable. Uh, already emerging, I think, as the classic work uh, on a truly great American whose reputation is largely now, I think, completely restored uh, as a result of this and a couple of the others that have been published in recent years. Um, again, I emphasize readable, lively, and enjoyable. As some might be intimidated by its size, you do get credit for arm curls uh, if you <laughs> lift it several times. But Ron is a brilliant storyteller, and I think you'll see that tonight uh, as we, we go through this. You've, you've heard uh, how Ron uh, wrote about John D. Rockefeller, Alexander Hamilton, the Warburgs, House of Morgan, George Washington. Um, how did you happen to write this biography? How did you choose? Well, to first, let me say, General, I'm just so touched and honored to share the stage with you this evening. You always pleasure. grace the, the stage of the 92nd Street Y. Uh, the way that I came to write this was that I had always had a fantasy about doing a big epic saga about the Civil War and Reconstruction. And the life of Ulysses S. Grant is the perfect prism through which to view those two periods. And really, the Civil War and Reconstruction form two acts of the same drama. And I like to say to people that if you know everything about the Civil War and little or nothing about Reconstruction, you've walked out in the middle of the play and you really don't know how it, how it ends. Sure, and he was central to all of that. Of course. Yeah, Grant is really uh, the figure that unites yeah. those two periods. Had Lincoln lived, he would have been yes. that uh, figure. But Grant is really the, the person who is at the center of the stage from 1861, the start of the Civil War, to 1877 when the curtain is rung down on Reconstruction. So let's perhaps go all the way back to the beginning, um, talk a bit about his origins, his parents, and so forth. Uh, a fairly modest upbringing. Yeah, he's born in 1822. He's born uh, Hiram Ulysses Grant, which uh, saddled him with the unfortunate initials Hug, H-U-G. <laughs> the boys teased him mercilessly, so he dropped the Hiram, and he became just plain Ulysses. Um, he was born in the southwestern corner of Ohio, about an hour outside of uh, Cincinnati. And this turns out to be a very interesting place for him to have been born, because he's born on this very bucolic stretch of the Ohio River. And the Ohio River at that time divides uh, the slave-owning state of Kentucky yes. from the free state of Ohio. In fact, uh, on winter evenings when the river would freeze over, fugitive slaves would sprint to freedom across uh -huh. the ice. And so I think that in terms of uh, you know, looking ahead to the grant of Appomattox and mm -hmm. someone who could actually understand the viewpoint of both the slaveholding South and the, and the free North. Grant is kind of born in this uh, strategic uh, spot that straddles the border between those two worlds. And as w when we go forward, of course, later, he marries into a family that really represents the opposite. Yeah, and he marries Julia Dent, uh, whose um, uh, family owns 30 slaves uh, on a plantation outside of St. Louis. So long before the Civil War, Grant is really involved in his own private Civil War. In fact, um, the Grant family, they were strong abolitionists, uh, and then Grant marries into a slaveholding family. Uh, and the Grants were so horrified by Ulysses marrying into the slave-owning clan that they all boycotted his 1848 wedding in uh, St. Louis. And so poor Grant is really uh, caught for many years between his overbearing <laughs> abolitionist father and his no less overbearing slave-owning father-in-law. In fact, when the war breaks out, his father-in-law, Colonel Frederick Dent, was heard to say that if his son-in-law, Ulysses, who of course had joined the Union side, uh, if Ulysses ever came on his property, he would shoot him like a rabbit. And you think you have a difficult in-law in your life, <laughs> looking for a grant. <laughs> now, before he gets to all that, of course, uh, somehow his father pursues machinations and he ends up going to West Point. 
Yeah, I mean, his father pretty much announces that yeah. uh, his son is going to West Point, um, uh, not because he wants Ulysses to be a famous uh, warrior, but he was a real skinflint. Uh, and <laughs> West Point for Jesse Root Grant represented a free form of vocational uh, education. It's so my parents too, by the <laughs> way. <but> I, you <laughs> know. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Grant, it's, it's very funny, um, uh, by his own admission, while he was at, uh, at West Point, there was a debate going on in Congress as to whether or not to abolish West Point. And Grant is avidly following it, praying that Congress will abolish <laughs> West Point so that he can be sent home. <laughs> not one of the more <laughs> avid students uh, of his time. But he wasn't awful, you know. No, he was, he was, he was kind of like Lester. Third, yeah, third yeah, he, of the he, class. You know, graduated yeah, you know, yeah. right around the, uh, yeah. the middle of the class. But the thing that uh, really struck me, particularly in comparison to the people that I'd uh, written about uh, before, is with Grant, there's no fire in the belly uh, yeah. whatsoever. By the time that he graduates from the academy, his highest ambition in life is to be an assistant math professor at the academy. Not a full math professor, no, no, no. but an assistant math professor is the extent of his ambition. So um, no one, least of all Ulysses Grant, could have foreseen that he would become general in chief of the US Army and a two-term president. And of course, he picks up a, a middle initial during this time as well. Uh, again, this is significant. Um, when the local congressman nominates him for the academy, he sends it in as the name is Ulysses S. Grant, who is forever after. Uh, stuck with this bureaucratic era. In fact, there's, there's, a, there's an amusing letter where he's actually explaining to his wife, I don't know why she hadn't asked earlier, where he's explaining to, to Julia uh, that the S stood for nothing. And I read that and said, gee, weren't you curious about that, you know, a few years ago when you married <laughs> <laughs> So he graduates from West Point, um, enters the Army, uh, some sort of not particularly fascinating uh, assignments early on. In fact, he even ends up in upstate New York. Um, fights his way back to the assignment that I guess he'd wanted. But does go to fight in the Mexican And war, then goes think, to Mexico yeah, you know, which and I distinguishes think, himself yeah, there. Yeah, really distinguished. I mean, yes. there, there were a few things that struck me about his, his time in uh, uh, Mexico. He was a quartermaster, which meant that he was, you know, mastering the art of logistics. It means that Grant is going to understand the yes. operation yeah the army from top to bottom in this kind of nuts and bolts fashion. And remember, in the Civil War, it's going to be fought in the South, which means that Grant is going to be defending these very, very long you know, supply lines uh, stretching hundreds of miles. So I think that quartermaster experience uh, was very important. I think the thing that most impressed me when he was in Mexico, as quartermaster, he was under no obligation whatsoever to fight. And yet, and yet again and again, yeah. uh, he um, joins uh, combat purely voluntarily, anyone else would have, you know, used the quartermaster job as a legitimate reason to mm -hmm. shirk battle, but he sees an enormous amount of battle. So by the time the Mexican War is o over, he really is a kind of battle-hardened veteran. At that Very point. much so. Yeah. yeah. He goes yeah. to the front constantly. Yeah. Breveted uh, promotion during that time. Yeah. And then, you know, at, at, at night we'll sneak out onto the to the battlefield to provide kind of aid to wounded mm -hmm. soldiers. And we begin to see this sensitivity that uh, he will later on show to his soldiers yes. in, the, in the Civil War, and sensitivity that he'll not only show to Union soldiers, but will show to yeah. Confederate yep. soldiers as well. Of course, his future opponent, Lee, uh, quite distinguished during the Mexican War. As yeah, well. and Lee is, Lee is older. I mean, Lee's early life is so different from Grant because Lee graduates second in his class yes. from West Point. He zero no demerits. Zero yes. demerits, which may be his greatest claim think, uh, to, to fame. Never equaled Do they still have the demerits? I, oh, yes, I assure you they do. Yeah. Yeah. I, <laughs> I won't ask you how many you got. I actually, I actually went, I think, two years with none. Uh, oh, okay. But, so, but there were also okay. two years in which I had. So, so you, were a, <laughs> you, you, were, you, you were a star, uh, too. And then, of course, Robert E. Lee becomes, you know, superintendent yes. of uh, yeah. West Point. So Robert E. Lee, you know, from an early age, looks like someone who's cut out for mm -hmm. military stardom. Ulysses S. Grant uh, does not, even though he's highly competent, you know, he's very brave, he serves with uh, uh, distinction, you know, is breveted, uh, et cetera. He goes back, and of course now he finally can marry Julia, this long-range courtship uh, he can, had. He can marry Julia, but um, you know Colonel Dent has been scheming the entire time to prevent Julia 
uh, from marrying Ulysses. He's convinced that Grand Don Meager Army Payne, it was Meager Army Payne, could not support Julia in the Southern Belle style to which she's accustomed. Mm -hmm. And on this one thing, the Colonel turns out to be right, because Grant is posted to a couple of very lonely, bleak garrisons in Oregon and Northern California, yeah. where he cannot afford to bring his wife and, at that time, one son. Uh, and so it sets up a situation. There are always uh, three situations that lead to Grant's drinking. You know, loneliness, inactivity, and desperately, desperately missing his family, and all three of those things apply in Oregon and Northern California. Let's just talk about the drinking and put yeah. that out of the way. Yeah. Because in, in all honesty, I'm a huge student of Grant, a huge admirer of yeah. Grant, uh, one who feels very strongly that uh, you know, what the Southern historians did to him in the previous yeah. century was just abyss, you know, just yeah. terrible. And um, we can talk about that a bit as well. Um, but this, I think, biography, one of the distinguishing features is you really deal with this in a very clear-eyed manner, and I think describe it quite clearly, and perhaps you might. Yeah, actually, you know, when I started working on the book, I thought that I would follow in the footsteps of, um, you know, recent biographies that have tended to say, oh, the drinking issue was overblown, all these stories were invented by his enemies. But, you know, there are now 32 thick volumes of Grant's uh, papers. And it has all of the wartime letters written to President Lincoln, written to Secretary of War uh, Stanton, uh, Secretary of Treasury Chase. Uh, some of these uh, letters about Grant's drinking were uh, signed. Some of them were um, uh, anonymous. Uh, and the explanation I was about, oh, these were st stories invented by malicious, you know, rivals mm -hmm. who were out to hurt him. And that, I thought, would be my conclusion. But, you know, I started reading the letters closely. These were letters written by different people at different times and different places. In other words, people who could not have coordinated what they were saying. They all described almost verbatim the same character drunk. Um, um, they would say, Grant was silly drunk, idiotically drunk, foolish drunk. There was not one of these letters, for instance, that said Grant was violently drunk, you know, or angrily drunk. And of course, we know that there are many people <coughs> who, when they're drunk, get angry or violent. There wasn't one. So I started thinking to myself, well, you know, maybe, the, uh, the, maybe these letters were being um, used by malicious rivals for their own end, but maybe there was some uh, truth to it. And so it turned out he was uh, an alcoholic. I was saying to backstage, I have 130 page references uh, to, the, uh, to his alcoholism. I began to feel that the problem was that for 150 years, the question was always posed, was Grant a drunkard? Now, that's a loaded word, because yes. drunkard implies someone who's dissolute, uh, dissipated, who's sort of gleefully indulging this vice, rather than I like to think we have a much more mature medical approach that this is a chronic uh, disorder. And Grant had really the two distinguishing features of an alcoholic, one by his own admission, uh, he could not have just one glass. Mm -hmm. That would lead to a second, a third, and a fourth. Mm -hmm. And, you know, no less important, again, by his own admission, as soon as he started drinking, it triggered off a massive personality change. He re went from this rather tightly buttoned-up character to someone who was sort of jovial, even silly. He would slur his words. He would stumble mm -hmm. around. And then, really, the clincher during the, um, the war, his adjutant and then chief of staff, John Rawlings, yes. uh, joins Grant's staff on one condition that Grant promised never to touch a drop of um, uh, liquor. Uh, Grant had many lapses, um, but uh, down at the uh, Grant Presidential Library at Mississippi State, uh, I found all of Rollins' correspondence, and Rollins became so obsessed <laughs> with keeping Grant sober, which for the most part he did, that he's sending to his fiance and then wife almost a daily letter reporting on Grant's uh, drinking. Say, so, uh, you know, I had this kind of front row <laughs> seat for the whole thing, so suddenly there was sort of no doubt what was uh, going on. And I think that we owe a tremendous debt to John Rollins, because Rollins had initially told Grant that um, if he uh, drank Rawlins would uh, quit his staff. Um, that didn't um, happen. The reason being John Rawlins, who became Brigadier General, was fiercely patriotic, yes. came to feel the fate of the Union rested yeah. on keeping Grant as yeah. the general so that he stays privately chastising Grant about the drinking, publicly defending him from all of those charges. Now, of course, when Lincoln heard that Grant drank, or someone reported that to him. As you know, he famously said, please find out what he drinks, at least right. he fights. <laughs> give, it to, give it to the other generals. That's right, he said, what, uh, what brand of whiskey, and he wanted to send a barrel to 
<laughs> is how the generals. So the drinking does, though, out on the West Coast, to go back to Grant now, a captain, um, it leads him to have to leave the Army. Yeah, he shows up at a pay table drunk. This is 1854. He then leaves, and this sets up a very, very uh, depressing period in his life. He goes back to St. Louis, yep. um, and he tries his hand at farming. Uh, he fails. He's in such uh, desperate circumstances that he's reduced to selling firewood on street corners in St. Louis. And one day, one of his old army buddies run in, runs into him and is shocked to find Grant selling firewood uh, on street corners. And he says, my God, Grant, what are you doing? And Grant said to him, I'm trying to settle the problem of poverty. Grant <laughs> had a sort of delightful wit, even at that dark moment. Uh, and then finally, by 1860, so now we're one year away from yes. the war, um, in what must have been the ultimate humiliation yeah. uh, for him, he goes to his impossibly overbearing father and asks if he can work as a clerk at his father's leather goods store in Galena, Illinois. His father agrees, and Grant uh, moves there with his uh, family. And Grant is almost 40 years old at this point, uh, and he's working as a clerk junior to his two younger brothers. And he's bored and restless, and this looks like it is going to be the most obscure and forgettable life imaginable. Then one year later, boom, Fort Sumter. Two months after Fort Sumter, he's a colonel. Four months later, Brigadier General. Ten months later, Major General. This may have been even quicker even than your promotion. than I did, yeah. And, uh, <laughs> And then and by the end of the years. war, by the end of the war, he's um, uh, general in chief yes. with a million soldiers yep. under his command, far and away the largest military machine we had ever assembled. Just extraordinary. And you know, as we were talking beforehand, uh, here he is. He's again a clerk, as you say, junior to yeah. his two younger brothers, and you know, having had to come back on bended knee to even do that. Yeah. How humiliating that must have been. And all of a sudden now there's the call for, for come to arms. Uh, but he demonstrates a certain degree of, of quiet self-confidence in that whole process. Yeah, it's quite amazing, you know, because here was someone who had kind of failed at one thing after another. You would think that this really would have dented his self-confidence. But the war breaks out. He still had all of that West Point lore stored in yeah. uh, his mind. He still had all and of And he's that. conscious of it, and he knows he's that. He's conscious yep. of it, uh, and uh, he has all of the combat and logistical experience uh, from the, uh, the Mexican War. And so it's amazing that uh, he um, becomes colonel, you know, is given a, uh, a regiment, and you instantly see this quiet, steady competence that is going to define him the war. This, I never had any sense of um, anxiety or yes. insecurity, which would have been understandable given how much you know, failure he uh, had had. And you know, it's almost like, and I'd be very curious because you've, you've seen so, you know, uh, so much uh, uh, combat. Um, you know, for most of us, we have a metabolism that in uh, everyday life we're very calm. If we're suddenly thrown into a situation of you know, danger, we're alarmed, we're frightened, you know, we're insecure, um, Grant seemed to be, Grant's metabolism was the, the opposite of the average person. He seems to come alive uh, in situations of combat and danger. He actually seems to be calmer. He functions at a much calmer level. He thinks clearly. He actually thinks much more yeah. rapidly yes. uh, than uh, he does. Let me ask you a question. Uh, sure. How, because you've seen so many people um, in that transition from peacetime role to a wartime role. How unusual is that in terms of, is, is that something that's It's very unusual. I mean, you do find it. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. what was interesting, I remember in the very beginning of the fight yeah. to Baghdad, yeah. uh, to give you an example, there was this one lieutenant colonel, battalion commander, who he was very, very good, yeah. very solid. We would have said he's brilliantly solid, but not necessarily solidly brilliant. Yeah. Um, and then there was another guy who was just sheer brilliant. You know, he's top of his yeah. class at West Point, had a high and tight haircut. He always looked great. He could keep up with me running. I mean, he was, yeah. so he was, he, <laughs> was, he yeah. was clearly destined for greatness. In fact, I had my eye on him to be the, the big position for, for a lieutenant colonel is the division operations officer. So after battalion command, everybody wants that position. And he'd really been, caught my eye. Uh, and lo and behold, I start watching this other guy, 
And he just sort of laconically, we'd link up with him in the middle yeah. of the fight one time. He's just basically walking down the road with all his radio operators and there's shooting going on over here. There's aircraft coming in over here, attack helicopters, machine guns. And he's just calm as can be. Uh, and that was when I realized how special that particular guy was. Mm -hmm. uh, by the way, I not only chose him to be the, the division ops officer, he came back when I was a three star, he came back when I was a four star as a brigade right. commander, was right. brilliant. Yeah. And actually he was my executive officer at Central Command and he went with me to Afghanistan. So, but we never would have, were it not for the war, the same with Graham. Yeah, and no, you know. This is the issue. Yeah, you know, this was a fascinating book for me to write because I felt that all the people I'd written about before, Washington, Hamilton, Rockefeller, et cetera, I felt they were all built for success. You know, from an early age, even in their adolescence, there was a drive and energy and ambition. You knew that they were going to succeed yeah. at something, whatever they tried to, to do. Uh, Grant is a different uh, story. Um, his wife, Julia, saw all of these kind of magical, you know, mm -hmm. hidden talents, but other mm -hmm. people didn't. But Grant is a story where he required a quite precise set of circumstances, and then these tremendous yeah. you know, strengths and virtues would uh, come out, which had not been apparent uh, otherwise. So if the war had broken, had not broken out, I have no doubt he would have stayed in the leather goods store, yeah. tried his hand at some uh, other thing, but would never have been known to, to history, which you don't feel when you're writing about a, a George Washington yes. or Alexander yeah. Hamilton. Yeah. They're like yeah. shot out of a cannon. Absolutely. Yeah. No, he just extraordinary in that regard. And by the way, you know, quite inspirational uh, when, you know, some years later I was commanding the surge. And as you know, uh, yeah. you've heard the story. Someone gave me Grant Takes Command by Bruce Catton. Story, yeah. Wonderful yeah. book. I mean, I thought, you know, I'm going to war here and somebody gives me a book. I said, thanks for that. Put it in a rucksack. <laughs> and somehow it ends up on this bedside table yeah. uh, where I had my bunk. And, you know, so I started and you'd get through two pages yeah. and it'd fall out of your hand, of yeah. course, as you fell asleep. Um, and it, I just found it breathtakingly inspirational. Uh, Grant had this just sheer indomitable will quietly. Uh, and uh, the determination was unbelievable, but he also had this feel. Uh, yeah. You've heard me say at the Grant Monument Association group that he is, I believe, the only Army general in history, yeah. Army, uh, to have demonstrated excellence tactically, that is sort of multiple brigades, division and below, uh, at, at uh, the land between the lakes, Donaldson uh, and so forth. Uh, operationally, now it's multiple divisions, uh, but not yet the whole theater. That was, uh, of course, is right. Vicksburg, one of the great operational battles of all time. And then ultimately, strategically, where he's the first to actually stitch it together. And so let's, we'll start down this. Uh, can, can I just ask you, because I, yeah. I love the story sure. that you yeah. uh, tell um, about the line from Shiloh that you use. <laughs> I can Let me ask you, you to tell well, that story. Well, I, I would, yeah. Uh, you yeah. know, and we use this actually somewhat metaphorically yeah. uh, on some very bad days in Baghdad. I remember, yeah. you know, we had a, just a catastrophic day. Enemy, several suicide bombers blew up markets. We lost 12 soldiers, I think, yeah. and, and the Rockies took a, a bunch of hits. And, you know, people's dog tags are dangling in the dirt, as they say. Their head is hanging down. Yeah. And so I remember going in uh, that night and, you know, I said, you know, I think this is a time to remember how Grant reacted after the first day at Bloody Shiloh. And as you yeah. know, this is his, probably his worst battle ever. Yeah. Surprised Sherman and he both are almost driven back into the Tennessee River. Uh, that night, there's no available shelter that is not being used as a makeshift hospital. Yeah. He was always affected by, and they're hacking limbs off. You can hear the cries. You can hear the mourn of the battlefield because they're still wounded out there, not been recovered. It's raining, of course infantry sunshine, as we say, uh, and, and he has a slouch hat on, and he's sitting under a tree just waiting for daylight. The rain is dripping off the hat. He's got the stub of a cigar in his mouth, and out of the darkness comes his favorite lieutenant, Sherman, uh, and Sherman says, well, Grant, we had the devil's own day today, didn't we? And Grant says, yep, lick him tomorrow, though. Yeah. And I found that so inspirational. I mean, we had the devil's own day, and so lick him tomorrow became one of the rallying cries, actually. I mean, it really became one of those, who is there, well, you know, lick him tomorrow. And yeah. it really is extraordinary, that quality that he had. Yeah, I mean, Sher uh, Sherman was once uh, asked to kind of define the essence of Grant's greatness as a general. And he replied, he said, Grant's simple faith in success, he said, I can liken it to nothing so much 
as the faith a Christian has in his Savior. Grant always knew that he was going to, to be victorious. And it was interesting, because Shiloh was, was uh, a, you know, a, a two-day battle. And yes. Grant made an interesting uh, statement later on in the war um, that he found that uh, very often the first day of two-day battles went for the Confederacy, because it would, you would see the kind of pluck you know, and dash yes. of the Confederacy. Uh, he said that he would always win on the second day because his and the Union's sort of, you know, grim, you know, relentless, you know, determination would start weighing in and counting on the, uh, the second day. And so Grant always was convinced that he was going to win. Another very interesting statement that he made was that there's always uh, a moment in a battle where both sides are convinced that they've been defeated. And he said, whoever then decides to take the offensive at that moment is going yeah. to, to win, which is, of course, what happened. And I don't think so. he ever felt defeated. No. Uh, which is, again, extraordinary. And that night on the Tennessee River, I mean, their back is literally, they're, they're clean to the riverbank, basically, yeah. tactically, yeah. getting reinforcements in, but never, never shaken at all. And, of course, the relationship he had with Sherman was quite extraordinary. And you remember the, the comment that Sherman said that, uh, you know, he stood by Grant while he was drunk and Grant stood by him while he was crazy. crazy. Now we stand... <laughs> Stand by each other always. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So let's go back. So he starts out now. Here he is, a yeah. colonel and then a brigadier general. And, and, and all of a sudden, the day of battle arrives, the, the first really momentous one with uh, Fort Henry and Fort Donelson. Yeah, there are these twin forts. You know, uh, Grant has the uh, insight that the way really to uh, in, in invade and dismember the Confederacy is to use the rivers because yes. there were these uh, two rivers, the Tennessee and the Cumberland, that ran north-south. And so they kind of provided a gateway, you know, down into the heart of the Confederacy. And there were these two forts, Fort Henry guarding, you know, yeah. on the Tennessee River and then Fort Donelson uh, on, the, um, on, on the Cumberland, you know, and it was at uh, Fort uh, Donelson uh, that um, he, um, the fort by the end is in charge of his friend, yes, Simon, Buck uh, Buck uh, Simon uh, Buckner, you know, who wants to appoint commissioners to negotiate a surrender. And Grant issues the famous you know, statement uh, that nothing less than you know, immediate and you know, unconditional surrender will uh, suffice. And so he became known as unconditional surrender Grant. And there's such a funny um, moment uh, because there had been three Confederate generals at Fort Donaldson. There was um, uh, John Floyd, who'd been the Secretary of War under Buchanan, there was Gideon Pillow, and then there was Buckner. Mm -hmm. And uh, Floyd and Pillow were convinced that um, if they were captured, they would be tried and executed for treason. So they flee, leaving Buckner uh, alone. And so uh, when Buckner surrenders to uh, Grant, uh, Buckner says to him, you know, if I had been in charge, you would never have been able to approach the fort in this way. And um, Grant says to him, and if you had been in charge, I would never have approached the fort in this way. <laughs> <laughs> you know, kind of, was very, of course, very they had yeah. history. We should they back had, up. Yeah, Remember when he meets him in New York? Meet him in New York. Yeah, I mean, he had bailed out um, uh, when Grant was down and out in, in New York in uh, 1854. Buckner had, um, had, had bailed him out. Yeah, so they were kind of old friends from, from West Point uh, the day. So there's always that feeling, uh, even during the, the, the Civil War, Grant has a lot of friends on the other yeah. side. So he never kind of loses that feeling. Well, Longstreet, I mean. Uh, Longstreet, well, is, is, uh, yeah, he's really my favorite Confederate yes. uh, 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 general uh, because, um, you know, this was after the war, there was be a whole controversy in terms of what had caused the war. And there'd been the so-called Lost Cause School in the yes. South that said the cause of the war was states' rights. And Longstreet, of course, was Lee's main lieutenant. Uh, Longstreet, when asked to comment on that, on that said, gee, that's funny, during the four years of the war, I never heard anything but slavery mentioned as the reason yeah. for the, the war. So he was not only a great general Longstreet, he was an unusually honest man. He was. Of course, there's no monument to him in Monument Road. No, and in fact, it's interesting because there's, yeah. there's only a single uh, monument to uh, Longstreet in the South, and it's in his hometown of Gainesville, Georgia. He, he, he was then, you know, uh, very much... Uh, demonized in the South yes. for the loss yeah. at Gettysburg, I think quite... Uh, well, he was a proponent of reconciliation as well. Was right, yeah, and he was also uh, that rare Confederate general who was a supporter of, uh, of Reconstruction. Yes. Yeah, it's yeah. a really great story. Well, so you have the victories at, at Donaldson and Henry, 
this now starts to build the name of Grant. Uh, he's sort of hamstrung by his supervisors for a while, and he works around that. At one point, they remove him. A lot of drama. But let's fast forward to, to Vicksburg, because this is what establishes Grant as a truly great general. That battle alone would have, I think, in yeah, there were all sorts of extraordinary features. You know, Vicksburg was, uh, you know, the, this this great uh, citadel on the gateway on the, to the south. The, you yes. know, the, the, the gateway to to the south, and it, it falls the same at the same uh, time that uh, uh, Gettysburg uh, does. And it's about two or three hundred feet um, on on this bluff above the uh, Mississippi River. It has extensive fortifications that run for almost uh, seven uh, miles. Grant very ingeniously, he tries actually to um, reorient the course of the Mississippi yes. River <laughs> in order to get by. Because you figure, how, how do you get you know, troops you know, downriver? The problem with Vicksburg was this. He had to get on um, a dry land to attack Vicksburg. And the only dry land um, was south. Oh, and he was north. So finally what happens, and this was a great example of the way that Grant would coordinate the Army and Navy, which yes. is very unusual in the Civil War. He runs all of these gunboats, you mm -hmm. know, um, past the, um, the, you know, the big guns at Vicksburg, marches the, you know, Army down the west uh, coast, and then he crosses over. He said he was never so relieved as when he got to the east bank of the Mississippi, because he suddenly is on high, dry land. And one thing I found that has not been sufficiently uh, emphasized about Grant, he was a master of deception. Yes. You know, there was sort of wonderful bag mm -hmm. of tricks that he used. So he's, he's kind of on the, um, you know, the East Bank. And I think most other generals would have gone straight up the East yes. Bank for, right to for Vicksburg. Vicksburg. And, but what Grant does in order to create a, a diversion, he has um, Sherman make an attack on Vicksburg from the north, a place called uh, Haynes's Bluff. He then uh, sends uh, his cavalry officer, Benjamin Grierson, on this long, I think it was like 600 you know, mile cavalry raid in eastern Mississippi. And the reason that he's doing this is uh, Pemberton, who was the Confederate commander inside Vicksburg, um, Pemberton is trying to figure out what the hell is going on. There's Grand South of the city, then Sherman's attacking him north of the city, and then there's Grierson with 1,700, you know, his horse soldiers, you know, tearing down eastern Mississippi. So he kind of has no idea what Grant is doing. And then Grant does something very daring and unexpected. Instead of just sort of going straight up the Mississippi, which would be the easy direct route, he kind of veers um, uh, northeast, pretty much cuts his supply lines, not entirely, yeah. but he's kind of living off the, the, the land. And what he's doing, because he knows that Joseph Johnson, the Confederate Army from the east, you know, might come to uh, relieve Vicksburg. So he's kind of zooming up, not only because he's going to attack you know, Vicksburg from the east, but he's throwing his army uh, in between Vicksburg and any uh, Confederate army that could possibly come to reinforce it. And then he has this dazzling series you know, of yes. five um, uh, uh, battles in uh, short order, and I think that, uh, what do you think? I think his greatest campaign? It, uh, it extraordinary, it's yeah. one for the history books. It yeah, really I mean, would is. that be, is that your oh, kind of? Oh, absolutely, uh, yeah, just yeah, extraordinary. Yeah, yeah. It, well, let's remember that Sherman writes a letter in advance of this campaign yeah. and insists that it be put in the official file saying that it's too risky. This is his most trusted lieutenant. Yeah, yeah, it was that daring. Yes. It, it was that yeah. unorthodox, yeah. he was kind of breaking uh, every rule that, 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 you know, at that time a commander was supposed to stay, uh, you know, closely in touch with his communications, yes, as they yes, called it, you know, yeah. with the supply lines. Yep. And so uh, he's doing um, everything that the textbooks at West Point told him he shouldn't do. Well, yeah. Again, and he divides his forces, he, he meets these others that are trying to reinforce, defeats each of them. Yeah. And then, of course, invests uh, Vicksburg in a siege and ultimately it has to capitulate. Yeah, and it was argued, you know, the fall of Vicksburg was arguably more important than the uh, Confederate defeat at uh, Gettysburg. Really was, yeah. uh, quite extraordinary. And it establishes him as the premier general. So now he's brought east, but by, uh, via Chattanooga, right. another interesting. Chattanooga, you're also you know, fascinating. Yep. By the time he gets to uh, uh, Chattanooga, uh, the Union Army there is really under uh, siege. It's trapped, because if you've been to Chattanooga, the south side of the town is this kind of towering uh, uh, lookout mountain. Then kind of on the east side is Missionary Ridge. And so the Confederates, you know, are commanding the heights and the Union Army is, 
is bottled up uh, down below. Grant gets there, and I think very characteristically, the first thing he concentrates is logistics. You know, he's going to be famous throughout the war that his soldiers are always well fed, you know, and well shod, yes. you know, and well clothed. And he opens up what was called the cracker line yes. because they would yeah. eat these, these hard biscuits. And so once he opens that uh, up, then he begins this series of um, maneuvers, and he has Joe Hooker cleans the Confederates off for a look at Manton. And then maybe the single most amazing day of the Civil War, what happens at Missionary Ridge, because uh, Grant was very fond. Uh, Grant had more confidence in Sherman than yes. any of his other commanders. So he wants Sherman to uh, take the northern end yep. of um, Missionary Ridge. But what happens is a very good Confederate General Claiborne who's fighting uh, Sherman. So Sherman is really kind of blocked at the northern uh, end. And so he has General Thomas, you know, attack in the center. And um, the expectations are fairly modest. They were supposed to take these rifle pits, you know, at the base of the mountain. And then something happens, and this is unlike anything I've yes. ever read yeah. in military uh, uh, history, because the Confederates kind of firing uh, straight down, it's a rather steep uh, mountain, and the uh, soldiers, just um, instead of you know fleeing away, they start fleeing up the mountain. As I say in the book, it was a mass outbreak of courage, <laughs> or maybe it wasn't courage. Maybe they were just trying to you know escape the this kind of slanting fire coming down. And Grant is watching this, and Grant has not ordered this. Grant is going to be the great beneficiary of this, but he and the other generals are just kind of staring, mystified. And then Grant says, well, let him go, let him do it. You know, he says, let's ride with, uh, with, with this. He sees that something extraordinary is happening. And it's a very interesting case in military annals, I think, of, it, of the, of the, of the tail wagging the dog. That well, suddenly, you know, the, the privates. It's, it's, it's <laughs> momentum that just continues. Just continues. You don't stop it. Yeah, and so, that the officers, as yes. it were, are kind of following the lead. Yeah, it just keeps of, going. Just, and all yeah. of a sudden, they have one missionary ridge. Yeah, and then they've cleared uh, Bragg and the- So uh, that's uh, over, that one's done. And yeah. it's, again, another extraordinary victory. Yeah. Um, so now he's clearly uh, the man. How, how many generals has Lincoln been through now? Is it seven or eight uh, at this point? McClellan well, by, twice. By, yeah, by the, you know, by the time um, Grant takes <coughs> over in uh, Virginia, you know, spring of 1864, uh, he's been preceded by six, six generals. And I just want to emphasize this because um, so many people, you know, then and now would say that Grant's success as a general is based on the fact that um, he had the advantage of northern population and northern manufacturing. But if you look at the history of the war in Virginia, there have been Irvin McDowell, George McClellan, John Pope, Ambrose Burnside, Joe Hooker, George Gordon Meade, six generals who had the same McClellan advantage. McClellan again. Yeah, McClellan again, I'm sorry. Uh, you know, so here were all these generals who had had the same advantage of northern manpower and material who had not been able yes. to defeat yeah. Lee. So clearly something is worse going on than just the advantages. And Grant was always very quick to point out how many disadvantages he labored under in the South. He had to protect these yes. enormously long supply lines. Yep. He was fighting in a place that Lee knew intimately. He mm -hmm. didn't know at all. Uh, Lee had, um, uh, well, the, the local population would function as spies for him. And then there was tremendous advantage at the time to fighting on the defensive, you know, yes. uh, that yeah. if you had well-entrenched fortifications, mm -hmm. uh, you could uh, hold off an army even two or three so times the size of the one uh, that you were defending. Which actually begs, you know, we might jump quickly just to Lee, yeah. because it's about this time that Lee goes to Gettysburg. Yeah. Um, and you know, as you try to compare Lee, and in fact, I showed you that Washington Post article I thought was so yep. good, The Truth About General Robert yep. E. Lee, he wasn't very good at his job, was the title. Um, because his, his objective should have been to keep the South in the war, keep the, the draft riots going, keep turmoil in the North as they're getting dissatisfied with the length of the war, and well, get, so, yeah, and get yeah. McClellan to win against, uh, of course, Lincoln, and he would have sued for peace. So the war, again, this is another often overlooked. The war could have actually been lost. It was not inevitable victory. Yeah, no, abs absolutely. And, and uh, Grant respectedly, but also um, uh, said on a number of occasions that he thought that uh, Lee was um, overrated. Uh, and he felt that during the, uh, the final year, well, you know, it's interesting because uh, after the war, um, Lee was asked who was the greatest Union general, and he says George McClellan. <laughs> 
It's kind of news to, news to historians. Uh, and then um, Grant is asked who was the greatest Confederate general, and he said Joseph Johnston. And last year, um, I asked Craig Simons, who's, who's John's, you know, Joseph Johnston's um, uh, biographer, he said, on what basis was that? Even he yeah. didn't know. I, I yeah. think what it was was that so many people threw Lee yes. into Grant's face, it just became a sore point, and he was damned if he was going to say that Lee was the greatest general. But he felt that during the last year of the war that um, Lee had made a major uh, strategic uh, blunder. Uh, Grant had felt throughout the war that the objective was not to destroy places, not to destroy enemy right. towns, but to destroy enemy armies. And he felt that Lee um, had a personal and political attachment to Richmond and Petersburg. He said that if um, at the time that uh, Sherman invaded Georgia, if Lee had broken away, going further south or going west, he said the war would have been prolonged for yes. another year. But Lee allows himself, yes. again, this is an emotional attachment uh, where he even says the Confederate cabinet that he's never, you know, never surrendering um, Richmond. It kind of allows Grant to sort of pin him, you know, down in Richmond and, um, uh, and Petersburg. And interestingly enough, right before that happens, during the Overland campaign, um, Lee himself tells his officers, because Grant keeps kind of moving, keeps yeah. sidling to the left, yep. kind of moving further down, finally has him pinned down um, in Richmond and Petersburg. And Lee himself said to his officers, if, that's, if that happens, um, it'll be a siege, and then we're lost. And yet he does walk right yes, into that trap. It turns out to be yeah. quite a long period yes, until yeah. Grant finally yeah. uh, uh, breaks That's right. Him. Remember Grant says, I intend in the, in the late summer of uh, 1864, I intend to fight it out on this it on all these summer lines. if yep, that's yep. what it takes. And it took, took all a lot fall longer, and all winter than and all that. spring exactly. before exactly. Appomattox yeah, in yeah, April yeah. 1865. But before this... Grant does something that no other of his predecessors have done, which is a true strategy for the war. He treats the entire war as one theater, and he actually yeah. gives a very coherent uh, direction. Yeah, in terms of Grant's strategy, he was just brilliant. Um, it seems like a simple thing, but when Grant is made general in chief in March 1864, the various Union armies operating the different theaters of war were fighting uh, separately. I think that seems strange to us today, but remember, the only thing that makes this possible of coordinating these armies over a 1500 mile area, uh, what makes it possible is the railroad and the telegraph. The railroad had really only come in in the 1830s and 1840s. The telegraph comes in the 1840s and 1850s. So these are relatively new yes. technologies. Mm -hmm. So it had not really been incorporated, I think, into strategic lore in terms of how to uh, coordinate it. So Grant takes over. And he has like this five, you know, prong strategy. Yep. You know, he and Meade are going to try a frontal assault, um, Siegel, and then later uh, Sheridan will clean out the Shenandoah yep. Valley. Butler will be coming up to Richmond, you know, Tidewater. from the, the southeast. Sherman will be invading Georgia, and then he'd wanted Banks to, uh, Nathaniel Banks to uh, invade Mobile, Alabama. That didn't happen for uh, various reasons. But he already is thinking in coordinated terms, and I think you know, there's always so much focus on the very high rate of casualties during the Overland Campaign. And I think most people don't realize that all of Sheridan's successes in the Shenandoah Valley, all of Sherman's yes. successes in Georgia, are going on under Grant's right. supervision right. and at Grant's direction. Right. And also, Grant, I mean, Sherman is succeeding partly because he carries out a very brilliant campaign, but also because Grant is pinning down... You yes, know, the uh, bulk of the army. Yeah, Lee, it's sure. in a way that he can't reinforce... Yes, that's right. Um, the, for, ...the Confederate And this forces. wins the election for Lincoln, which means that the war is now over until, you know, obviously you have to follow through into 1860. But mm -hmm. with the, the re-election of Lincoln, of course, arguably the greatest accomplishment of Grant, uh, because that battlefield victory, first in Atlanta, arguably yeah. that did it, but if that didn't, then... Sheridan's victory. It changes the, the whole thing because uh, Link, even Lincoln is yes. convinced that he's not going to be reelected. And then um, Atlanta falls uh, during the first week in September uh, and it completely turns around the election for, for Lincoln. And George McClellan, the Democratic nominee, um, was uh, very uh, popular. And Grant was convinced that if McClellan, who was a so called peace Democrat, mm -hmm. he was convinced that if um, uh, McClellan became president, that the North would sue for peace, and yep. that uh, not only would slavery be preserved, he, but he thought that 
the South would um, insist upon the return of any slaves who had been freed, that uh, Southern plantation owners would demand indemnification mm -hmm. for slaves who were uh, lost, and it would really have been a catastrophe yes. if that had happened. Yeah. So he wins. I mean, again, he wins the war by winning the election, in a sense, with the battlefield yeah. victories. Uh, of course, now, if we, by the way, we probably should talk about something that took place while he was general also a bit earlier, which is this anti-Semitism. Oh, yeah, yeah, no, yeah, I think particularly in the walls of the 92nd century, why we definitely should talk about that. <laughs> Yeah. Um, okay, this is the story, because a lot of people know one part of the story, but not the other. The part that a lot of people uh, know is that in December 1862, uh, Grant's army is penetrating into uh, Mississippi, which means it's in the heart of the Cotton Kingdom. And what's happening, there's a large illicit trade of, of people selling southern cotton uh, to northern mills. Grant is trying to stop it. <coughs> there were a lot of Jewish traders who were involved. There were many more non-Jewish traders, but not for the first time in history, the Jews were blamed. And Grant issues an order, infamous General Orders Number 11, which not only forbids Jewish traders from his military department, but bans Jews as a people from his department. So this is clearly his most atrocious anti-Semitic action in American history. <coughs> Grant later said he immediately regretted this order as soon as he sent it to Lincoln and Stanton. Lincoln and Stanton see it, they're horrified, they immediately overrule it. So it doesn't, it doesn't really have an effect, um, but certainly Grant is stamped you know, with the label of um, um, anti-Semite. What people don't know is that Grant spent the rest of his life atoning yes. for this action. Um, when he became president, he appointed more Jews to public office than all the other 19th century presidents uh, combined. His uh, friend, uh, Simon Wolf, Jewish lawyer said, that he alone recommended 50 Jews who were appointed. Uh, the Jews, incidentally, um, really credited Grant's atonement, his conversion, because the Jewish community overwhelmingly uh, supported him in the 1868 and 1872 election. Some really remarkable things that he did as, pre as president in terms of the Jewish community. One, at the time, it was unheard of for American presidents to complain about human rights abuses abroad was considered meddling in the internal affairs of other countries. Grant twice uh, protests human rights uh, abuses abroad. Um, in one case, um, Jews are being exiled by the Tsar to Siberia, he protests. <coughs> the other time, there's a pogrom in, in Romania. Not only does Grant protest, uh, but he appoints, I think, probably first Jewish diplomat, or certainly one of the first, Benjamin Franklin Peixoto, I love that name. <laughs> Benjamin Franklin Peixoto is appointed general counsel to Romania. Peixoto was there for five years. All he's doing there is rescuing Jews, and he's actually taking persecuted Jews into his home as a general counsel. And then the story that touches me most of all, during Grant's last year as president, he's invited to the dedication of a synagogue in Washington, D.C. called Ades Israel. It's an Orthodox uh, synagogue, which means that the dedication ceremony is all in Hebrew. So Grant is sitting there with his hat on and shawl on, uh, of course, doesn't understand a word. Um, after an hour, and this is a tiny, this is such a tiny synagogue, it still exists, but it would fit onto this stage. So we're talking about a synagogue, maybe 40, 50 people. After Grant's sitting there for an hour, and he brought his son, he brought the president pro tem of the Senate, the elders of the congregation go over to Grant and say, Mr. President, we're so touched that you would come to this synagogue dedication. You can leave now without anyone in the congregation feeling offended. Grant said, no, I'm staying to the end. So he stayed three hours for this dedication. And at the end, he opened his wallet and gave a personal donation yeah. to, the, to the synagogue. So when, when he died in 1885, one of the honorary pallbearers was a uh, Rabbi Brown. Uh, and um, one of the Jewish newspapers in Philadelphia, the Daily Record, um, wrote after the funeral uh, that no one has occasion to mourn more sincerely the death of General Grant than the Hebrew. Mm. So he really, he really changed his, his, his image. It was more than change of image. It was a real change of heart. Yeah. Let's go, uh, I guess, fairly quickly to, of course, he does Appomattox famously fairly kind uh, terms. Yeah. Uh, to Lee and to the soldiers, the officers keep their 
forces and their sidearms and all this. Quite benevolent in, a, in effect. Lincoln supports that. Um, and then tragically Lincoln is assassinated and now you have Johnson. And the whole, I think one of the most overlooked periods and most overlooked contributions that Grant makes is in some ways keeping the country together during this ruinous presidency of Johnson. Yeah, also what happens, you know, because um, most people know very little about that four years between uh, the end of the Civil War and the beginning of his presidency, but during that four year uh, period, uh, the South is placed under military rule. Uh, the radical uh, Republicans um, divide the South into five military districts. Grant is still uh, general in chief. At one point, he's act acting Secretary of War. So all five of those commanders are, re are reporting to Grant. And I found it so fascinating to read that correspondence because during that period, a civil rights movement took place in the South that I find that people know little or nothing about. I'll never forget reading an 1867 letter. Phil Sheridan was a district commander for Louisiana and mm -hmm. Texas. 1867, Sheridan writes this astonishing letter to Grant where he says, Dear General, we desegregated public streetcars in New Orleans this week. And he proceeds to tell the following story. He said that there were whites only and blacks only streetcars. And he said that the blacks, former slaves, now full-fledged citizens, um, black citizens began to pile onto the white-only streetcars in protest. The streetcar companies then turned around and uh, appealed to Sheridan, you know, what should we do? And Sheridan said to them, uh, unless you integrate uh, the streetcars, uh, you won't be able to operate on the streets of uh, uh, New Orleans. And so then Sheridan ends this letter to Grant saying, well, we had a little bit of a ruckus, but now blacks and whites are riding cheerfully side by side on streetcars in New Orleans. Now think about this a moment, folks. It's what a I little just before told you, Rosa Parks. This, was, this is 90 years before Rosa Parks. They were black people in protest, piling onto white-only streetcars in the South. And we know nothing about these really unsung uh, heroes and Grant is kind of overseeing this whole process and also very, very touching uh, as, com as commanders are reporting uh, that uh, how um, blacks are embracing e education, uh, becoming literate so quickly and initially are voting in very high um, numbers in some, you know, black districts uh, as high as uh, 80, 90 percent, which of course petrifies the white South because Blacks were a little bit more than a third of the Southern population, but in South Carolina and Mississippi, they were a majority of the population. So if blacks were going to exercise the right to vote, uh, this was going to mean that they would have to share real power with the black uh, community. And this, of course, sets up this extraordinary tension in the country. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And of course, the generals were doing extraordinary things during that time down there. Yeah, I, I mean, uh, <laughs> I, I don't know, nation building, I don't know what you'd call it, you know, what was uh, uh, going that. on there. But and they were it, running it, states, basically. Yeah, uh, yeah, the, 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 they were running states, you know, uh, some, you know, willingly, some, you know, yeah. uh, unwillingly, but uh, all were extremely uh, dutiful uh, about this. And all kind of very proud and impressed with the rapid gains being made by the African-American community. Yeah. Uh, in, in the South, gains that would, alas, then be yes, rolled back. Yeah. sadly. Yeah. How does he come to run for president, Ron? Well, you know what happens, uh, you know the story, in 1868, um, Andrew Johnson uh, uh, is impeached, although he's acquitted by uh, one uh, vote. Um, and, you know, Grant is looking better and better. Actually, you know, Grant was such a firm believer uh, in the um, military subordination to the civilian uh, that even in 1868, there was, he was, Grant was far and away kind of the most popular, you know, and famous uh, American. But no one was quite sure of his political affiliation. But he had been increasingly sympathetic with Reconstruction. Mm -hmm. Reconstruction was, you know, um, very much the Republican. creation of the Republican uh, Party. So the Republican Party st started sending out emissaries to figure out Grant's politics. And then they find out that he's a Republican and very, very sympathetic. Uh, with Reconstruction, he really, I mean, if ever there was an inevitable uh, candidacy, and you were, you were, you were saying uh, backstage before, you know, that Grant was ambitious, he was. 
but he had a kind of marvelous way of making it seem as if he was sort of being, you know, <laughs> carried along by force majeure <laughs> in, some, in some way. But he had a way of kind of making himself, you know, available at these uh, <laughs> moments. And then really kind of wins by, um, certainly in terms of the electoral vote, wins by um, twice by overwhelming yes. uh, margins and then even tries a third time in 1880. How, uh, by the way, let me start getting, feeding some questions sure. in here from the audience. Um, what would Grant think of today's political climate? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, he lived through um, a bitterly polarized, you know, period himself, so that was uh, not surprising. Well, let me feed another one in. Is America more divided now than it was during the Civil War? <laughs> Well, you know, people, I mean, there's been talk, you know, will there be a, a political realignment? We have very, very significant uh, divisions in both uh, uh, parties. And so I've thought about this a lot. Um, I don't think that there is a single overwhelming issue the way that, that slavery yes. was. You know, where yeah. slavery kind of, you know, breaks up the yes. Whig Party, you know, breaks up the, uh, the Democratic Party, you know, the Republican Party really emerges from the ashes of you know, northern and southern you know, uh, Whigs uh, dividing. I don't think that the um, level of feeling about the immigration issue or the trade issue, which would probably be the two issues most associated with President Trump, I don't think however strongly people feel about those, that those are kind of powerful enough to completely you know, redefine um, the, the, the parties, but we shall we shall see. See, the nice thing is about historian, I get to write about events 150 years ago, and so I sound very kind of, you know, wise and intelligent. <laughs> 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 you know. Actually, so what is it? This says also, what would Hamilton think of today? What would Hamilton think? Well, you know, it was interesting because if I can just refer to the, to the show for um, a, a moment, I, I think that one of many reasons that the show, you know, has been so popular is that the show has kind of a split personality. It's, uh, it's two acts. Uh, the first act is very inspirational and uplifting. Uh, it shows what we could do, you know, when we are unified mm -hmm. and we can win a war against the British, we can write a constitution, we can forge a federal government. But the second act also shows that a lot of the partisan malice that so upsets us now actually traces back to um, the 1790s and I think is very brilliantly dramatized, yeah. you know, by Lynn in the show, and so uh, I think it's important in terms of that you know, first act of the show, in terms of inspiring us and, and, and showing what we have been capable of doing in the past when we were united, but the second act also kind of cautionary uh, tale, how poisonous politics yes. can become. Yeah. yeah, you know, I thought the genius of that candidly, uh, really with the book, was that it comes at a time when Americans have relatively unformed opinion of Hamilton. I mean, not a household name, not one. Uh, and I think the book and then obviously the success of the play helps America develop uh, an opinion of him that is fairly informed, I think positive, but with a recognition that he was yeah. someone with that. Well, I mean, it's funny, because when I started the, uh, writing the book in, in, um, in 1998, I, one of the reasons I chose it is that uh, Hamilton seemed to be fading into obscurity, which seems comic now that his yeah. name is up on the marquee on West 46th Street. Um, but I, I had actually, when I was doing uh, uh, Grant, I had a very similar feeling uh, as when I, I was, was writing just the, going the, the to Hamilton say that, book, actually. that yeah. I felt you know, he'd been yeah. done in, Yes. Uh, by his uh, enemies, his, his, his record had been mm -hmm. trivialized and uh, distorted. You know, the story of his presidency is always kind of caricatured as the scandal-ridden administration. And there were scandals, I talk about them at length uh, in the book, but he himself was not personally involved in them, he did not condone them, he prosecuted them uh, vigorously. But I really feel that the central story of his presidency, and it was one that was tr tremendously uh, courageous was um, his crushing of the Ku Klux Klan. Yes. You know, he appoints a crusading yep. attorney general named Am mm -hmm. Amos Ackerman from Georgia. And actually, coincidentally, the same week that he appoints Ackerman, the Justice Department was created. We'd had an attorney general going back to the days of George Washington. The attorney general didn't have a, a department. So the first great crusade of the Justice Department becomes crushing the Klan. And this was at a time when uh, no Southern sheriff would arrest a member of the Klan, no mm -hmm. Southern white would testify against a member of the Klan, no Southern jury would 
uh, convict him. There were thousands of blacks who were murdered, and these blacks, these murders went completely unprosecuted. Uh, Grant with Ackerman, and then his successor, George Williams, as Attorney General. Uh, they bring more than 3,000 indictments, get more than 1,000 convictions, and the, the Klan is really crushed. The Klan that we know today, which alas is still with us, um, the Klan we know today was really the resurgence of the Klan from the 19-teens and the 1920s. Yes. Grant actually crushed it yes. at the time. You know, and for me, in terms of um, you know, what he did for the African-American community at that time in terms of the legacy of American history, this seems to be a much, much more important story than these scattered yes. you know, scandals. But I think that you know, his foes made sure that that scandal-ridden administration label really yeah. stuck to it. Yeah, no, without question. You know, if you think of Grant, there's uh, arguably a three-act play. There's Grant the General. Yeah. The, the really accomplished. You shouldn't say play with me on the stage. No, I, should, I shouldn't. <laughs> Although we, I want you to know the movie rights, the movie rights to Grant have already been uh, been sold, and so this will not be a musical. It'll be the right. greatest yeah. movie in the Civil War uh, in, in 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 history, really, since there have been no really great ones since yeah. uh, Gone with the Wind, and that obviously <laughs> elevated uh, the South a tad, shall we say? Um, <laughs> so, but. Part three is actually Grant the writer. Grant how writer. does this come about, and then how does he then have to have this desperate race against throat cancer? Yeah, you know, in the last year of his life, I mean, two things happened. Number one, he's the victim of the Bernie Madoff of his day, a young financier yes. named Ferdinand yep. Ward. Yep. So Grant, in his innocence, thinks he's worth a million dollars. He wakes up one day and discovers he's worth exactly $80. Not only was he completely wiped out, his three sons were completely wiped out with uh, Ferdinand Ward. And then, by an unfortunate coincidence, Grant is diagnosed with cancer of the throat and tongue right around the same time. So he is petrified that his wife, Julia, is going to be left destitute when he dies. And so he spends the last year of his life, often in extraordinary pain, uh, writing these memoirs that are considered the greatest military memoirs in um, American letters. But you know, what I discovered as I was doing the, the, the book is that Grant had always taken tremendous pride in his writing. Yes, oh yeah. yeah. Um, he um, wrote all of his uh, wartime orders and his, uh, you know, his military staff said that he could dash up like 30, he, he 40 consecutive orders, each one very precisely. Yes. And all in perspective, well, but yeah. time and in space, M amazing. which is again, yeah, really Wellington yeah. had the same, you know, but yes, he did. Fire yep. off one after another. Yep. Uh, also, um, Grant took tremendous pride in the fact that he wrote all of his own speeches and papers as president. There was, wasn't like the modern White House where there's kind of a whole speech writing team. It was Grant writing uh, all of this. So I think that for people who knew Grant, it was perhaps somewhat less surprising that this literary talent, you know, was there all uh, along. And you know, I, I um, when I started telling people I was doing the book. Um, <laughs> everyone had one or two reactions. They either said to me, who's buried in Grant's tomb? Which was an old, I'll tell it. you know where that comes from? Uh, Groucho Marx, remember in the 1950s, had that quiz show, You Bet Your Life, in which the contestants would come out and Groucho would mercilessly ridicule them. And he began to feel so s sorry for the contestants that they couldn't a answer a single question that he decided he would ask everyone a question that everyone would be able to answer. And the question was, who's buried in Grand's tomb? And to Groucho's astonishment, half the contestants got it wrong. <laughs> 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 but then the, the, the other thing that, you know, the other half of the people uh, said to me, uh, did Mark Twain ghostwrite yes. the memoirs? Yeah. And I actually went down to the Library of Congress. I knew that he had not, but I figured uh, I'd better have convincing evidence of this. And I went down to the Library of Congress and they wheeled out the original manuscript in nine beautiful uh, volumes bound in dark blue leather. And I went through every page of it. And up until the very end, uh, where he had to dictate to his son and a stenographer, it was all in his uh, handwriting. It was just an amazing achievement. But this is Grant's life. He just keeps yes. surprising you. Yes. He starts out, yeah. he seems so ordinary. And then kind of one amazing attribute after yes. another yeah. comes out. Now, he is helped by Twain, of course, in the marketing aspect of this. Oh, yeah. I mean, Tell the you know, story well, about Twain, how he yeah, Twain was Twain absolutely a shameless as well, You know, what, what happened was that um, uh, Twain and his nephew, Charles Webster, had set up a publishing company really to publish Huck Finn and Twain's other uh, books. 
Twain finds out that Grant, under duress because he's been wiped out, is going to write his memoirs. Twain is a shrewd businessman. He was kind of money crazy in a lot of ways, and he realized this was going to be the great bestseller of the 19th century. So he goes to Grant. He doubles the royalty offered, you know, by the other publisher. And what he does, the, uh, the memoirs were sold um, in uh, uh, two volumes by subscription. Twain, <laughs> and this I can understand, Twain didn't want to have to deal with reviewers, <laughs> you know, so if, if people were buying it by subscription, you didn't have to worry about the, you know, the reviewers. And what he did was that he assembled a large uh, sales force, a lot of them Civil War veterans, you know, who went door to door, kind of knocking on doors. Everyone knew the story about Grant's cancer and being wiped out financially. And he had all these vets, you know, going door to door saying, can you help out the general and subscribe, you know, to <laughs> his members. <laughs> so they sold um, 300,000 sets. In other words, 600,000 yeah. uh, books at a time when I think the population of the United States was about 40 million. So it's about 330 million now. So these would be extraordinary numbers today to sell 600,000 uh, books, but the population is about, what, eight or nine times you yes. know, as large yes. Yes. as then. So Twain, and um, you now he, he wrote these very funny instructions to his salesman. Give it the old bull run, you know. Try. I mean, he, you know, he kept exhorting them, <laughs> <laughs> kept exhorting them to go out there as if he was, you know, a general, and this was sort of a battle, you know, campaign. But he did I, actually. After Grant died, uh, Twain handed uh, Julia a check for, I think it was four hundred fifty thousand dollars, which would probably be about ten million dollars today. So Julia, instead of being left destitute, as Grant feared. Uh, Julia is left a very rich woman, and she lived for another 17 years, so she really needed the money. And so he re retrieves, again, uh, a very, very desperate situation, fighting against his final foe, which, of course, he ultimately succumbs to. Yeah, and uh, I, you know, I found that you know, one thing that Grant did have in common with all the people that uh, I have written about, although he starts out in a much less promising fashion, he had the capacity to grow. And I think that's why he keeps surprising us. And he keeps getting better at everything that uh, he, he does. And I think that he keeps discovering different uh, talents. You know, one of the stories I love about Grant that I was mentioning that period back in the 1850s, uh, Grant is selling firewood on street corners yes. in St. Louis. Yeah. And, um, you know, he's just desperate. People run into him, you know, his beard is ragged and he just looks uh, a wreck. And during that period, and he has a wife and four children to support, during that period, uh, Julia Grant has a dream that Ulysses has become president of the United States. And when she tells that dream to her friends and family, they all laugh at her. I mean, she seemed pathetic and ridiculous yeah. that her husband yeah. is desperately yeah. just trying to and make ends is. meet and he's going to be president of the uh, United States. But the women saw Grant's strengths long before the event, because his, his mother-in-law had the same reaction to him, that there was like this quiet strength. Yes. Let's actually end with this story you've told about uh, Julia uh, yeah. and, and the affection that Grant had for her and how he answered when she declined to have the wandering eye. Yeah, it was, it was, a, it was a real um, uh, love mm -hmm. match. Um, uh, people who observed them all said the same thing, that you know, at a party, they would uh, sit in the corner, you know, holding hands like teenagers. They never lost that romantic uh, feeling. Uh, Julia was, you know, was not a raving beauty. She had a strabismus, like a squint eye, cross eye. She was so self-conscious about it. Later on, as first lady, she insists that all photos be taken of her in profile to hide the, mm -hmm. you know, the cross eye. But there's a very, very touching uh, moment that happens during the Civil War. Uh, Julia quietly goes to consult a doctor in terms of whether this eye uh, problem can be surgically corrected, and he says to her, you're too old to have the operation. When she next sees Ulysses, um, she tells him that she has consulted uh, a doctor about this and what the doctor said. And uh, Grant is thunderstruck, and he said, Julia, why ever did you go to see a doctor about that? And she says to him, she called him Ulysses. She said, oh, Ulysses, I'm such a plain little wife and you've become such a great general. This was during the war. And Grant's uh, reaction is so poignant because uh, he turns to her and says, 
didn't I fall in love with these same eyes? And uh, I never want you to change them uh, or interfere with them again. I mean, no Hollywood screenwriter could have improved on <laughs> that <laughs> response. So Grant, <laughs> among his other talents, you know, had pretty good uh, romantic uh, touch. <laughs> <laughs> well, Ron, this has been a true delight. And ladies and gentlemen, I hope you understand now why I was so pleased as a huge admirer of Grant uh, when I learned a couple of years ago that Ron Chernow, uh, who has won so many awards and profiled so many other great figures, uh, had chosen Grant as his subject because, as I said earlier, I think it really will cement uh, his reputation. Yeah. Uh, and I hope you also saw just what a delightful uh, interviewee <laughs> Ron is, because I can assure you that this book is every bit as delightful. Thank you so much. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you. That was great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.